Can we use those technologies to create an inter internet of things that is decentralized, that is uh, user centric, that is owned and controlled by the people whose devices uh, are who who the devices are around, um, in a way that doesn't uh, create these very centralized, uh, very privacy violating systems controlled by a few large uh, technology companies. I think that's the real question we should be asking ourselves. Shamai, welcome. That was a video of Andreas Antonopoulos on the excellent Bitcoin report. Uh, I'll put a link for the, the full video in, in the description. It's, it's well worth a watch. It's an excellent um, interview. Um, in it, he's just discussing that the Internet of Things should be a user-led uh, movement um, and it should have free and open source uh, methodology, which is, you can't really argue with. Um, and that's particularly important, I think, when it comes to the Bitcoin, when it comes to Bitcoin. Um, and devices which are going to be engaging with Bitcoin in some way. So I thought it'd be interesting to make um, a couple of little tutorials exploring some of the hardware because it's really rather cheap and it's quite easy to program now. Um, exploring some of the hardware, make a couple of interesting projects. Uh, this first project isn't um, uh, going to be uh, transferring any value per se, but it is going to be um, protecting value. So this is the, uh, the ESP32, um, uh, which is a um, microcontroller by a company called Expressive Systems. Um, if I cut this camera here, if we can zoom in. It's really very small um, and cheap device. They're about five pounds or uh, uh, $4 if you can get them on sort of AliExpress. I if it's gonna zoom, if it's gonna focus. There we go, we're focusing there. As you can see, it's got a whole bunch of little GPIOs here. Um, so that general purpose input output pins we can we can make use of. Uh, it's got a microcontroller with uh, Wi-Fi capability, Bluetooth. Um, it can uh, it has enough memory to be able to run a little web server. Um, uh, uh, yeah, so it's 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 a it's a it's a very useful cheap device which we can we can build all sorts of interesting things with. Originally, it was um, uh, sort of the the. the the original uh, chip from Expressive Systems was the ESP8266, which is this one here. Um, and originally it was a, a module and an additional module for Arduino boards and it's a Wi-Fi module, but they did such a good job that it had better processing power than most of the, the Arduino boards. So people just started using those on boards themselves. Um, these things are incredibly cheap. They're about um, $2 to buy probably. So, you know, nothing really. These ones are a little bit more expensive. It's sort of like four or $5 on, on AliExpress or Alibaba. Um, but they're, 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 they've got many applications. The application we're going to be exploring is we're going to we're going to turn this into a fake uh, hardware wallet. Um, uh, the idea being that if somebody um, breaks into your home and catches you unawares, so you can't access your chlorine gas or what other um, uh, uh, pre preventative measures you have in your home. Um, if they catch you in a words and you just want to try and get a message out and ask for help from people, um, this little device is going to send a message to a Telegram group, which you're going to set up, and you're going to put a bunch of friends on that Telegram group, preferably friends from all over the world, so there's always someone um, uh, who could who could see the message. And then when this is the idea being that when this is plugged in, uh, it will send a message every 10 seconds saying help. Um, somebody's trying to steal my Bitcoin stash. Uh, this is my address. These are my details. Can you please call my local police on this number um, and get them to send help round? Which I know we're all cypherpunks and you know lots of people don't agree in, 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 in government police, but I assure you if you're in that scenario, then you would probably want their help. And most of us thankfully have the luxury of, of, of having um, uh, of having a, a, a police service we can call to uh, when, when we're in need and when we're in trouble. So that's the that's the project we're going to be making. Um, other applications could be that, which maybe we'll explore, that we could add a, uh, a little button um, and then we could have this as kind of a, a panic alarm. So you could have the exact same code and then put one of these, I don't know, next to your bed. And then if you if someone breaks in and you can hear them running up the stairs, shouting, give me all your Bitcoin, then you can flick the switch and it'll, it'll perform the, the exact same task. Um, most commercial safes, uh, 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 high-end safes, will have some sort of trip mechanism, which will 
some sort of booby trap thing which will, will send out a, a, a help signal. Um, so I'm, I'm always, it's always a wonder to me why some of the hardware wallets haven't picked up on this. So Trezor, you know, it wouldn't be that hard to be able to program in like, you know, two uh, passcode numbers, one passcode, which is slightly different, has an extra number in it. And that passcode would then um, send out a, a, a help message to somebody um, or, or something to that effect, I don't know. Um, uh, I'm sure that's something which some hardware wallets could have explored. But for in the meantime, we can just make a little fake hard hardware wallet and try and convince the criminals this is our hardware wallet. They'll plug it in for us and they'll they'll trip the switch and then they'll they'll cause help um, uh, to come and help us. So so yeah, so we're, we're gonna we're gonna dig right in, I suppose, and start and start coding up. When you um, let me switch to the screen here. Um, once you've installed uh, the Arduino IDE, we are going to use the Arduino IDE. I know it's not particularly cool. Um, other pe other people prefer you know other sorts of text editors and, and um, programming environments, but because we're noobs and you know because we're we're we're, we're imbeciles, we're, we're going to use the Arduino IDE. It's nice and simple. Um, uh, the first thing you'll need to do when you've got your ESP32 uh, is to install uh, the board onto the Arduino, into the Arduino library. So I'll quickly show you how to do that. In fact, we could even just have a quick look now um, on like AliExpress or something and see if we can uh, have a look at the prices of how much these things are going for at the moment. Get that for you. Let's click on an ad, right. Well, there's one there for $3, that's pretty cool. Um, that one hasn't got the um, uh, the resistors and capacitors and the LEDs and things, which kind of make it a little bit more of a stable environment. Um, it's probably worth spending a little bit more. There we are, two, two extra dollars on having all that stuff built in. And it's even got little, little legs already soldered on. What was cool about that other one, though, is it was small, so it'd be really easy to kind of dress that up as a, as a hardware wallet of some sort. Um, some of them also have little OLED dis displays in, which is quite sweet. Uh, we're not going to be exploring that today, but we probably will soon, if not in the next, um, if not in the next video. So you want to install the SP32 into into this environment. If we, I think, if we type in ESP32 core, I think we should get the GitHub for expressive systems. Here we go. Yeah. So this is the um, uh, the GitHub for expressive systems, um, and in here, if we go to installation instructions. And then we click on Boards Manager. Right, we're going to want this JSON file here. So there's just this URL. So we copy that URL. We go back to our um, Arduino ID and we go to Preferences. And in here, I've already done it obviously, we paste that URL in there, okay? And I'll be able to import the, um, the library, the board library. Then we go to Boards, Board Manager and we search for sp32 here we are um, and then you'll obviously have to click on install um, and then the the library the board the specific board i'm using um, this i think this is the esp32 uh, dev kit which i'm using um, so the the board is the lowland d32 um, but I mean, if you whenever you buy your board it's, it's fairly easy to find out which which board you should be using on here okay um, when you install that, it installs a whole bunch of, of libraries, which is quite useful. Um, so we're going to make use of those libraries. Uh, because we're sending a message out to Telegram, uh, we're going to have to, um, and, and we also were sending out personal details, so it's going to be over SSL, it's going to be HTTPS. Um, Arduino's always been uh, pretty poor at doing that because a lot of the microcontrollers just didn't have the processing power to do SSL. Um, but now they have. And there's a few libraries out there which are, you know, are okay. This one's this one seems to be the best one I can find. So we we, we have um, a library called Wi-Fi Client Secure, which we're going to um, include in the top of our our, our program. Um, now, I do apologise for the, a the speed of my typing and the accuracy of my typing. As I said, I am an imbecile, so I have a disclaimer. Um, but I've not seen a tutorial like this, so if someone more proficient wants to come along and do a better tutorial, that'd be cool. I'd like that. Okay, you're going to have to put in your, your Wi-Fi details um, for your microcontroller to actually connect to your own personal Wi-Fi. Um, 
So we're going to make a couple of variables for that. A couple of character arrays. Um, and this is just uh, that's this is just your Wi-Fi, yeah. Uh, and silly me. Okay, password. There we go. Right. Um, we're going to be using this Wi-Fi client secure here. One of the perimeters which it uses uh, is, a, is a host perimeter. So we're going to write that in the top there now as a constant char. Um, and we're going to, so that is, uh, we're going to call that host. Um, and that is api.telegram.org. And we're going to be using um, an integer for the port number https port and that is going to be 443 which is the standard ssl um, port number which is used okay and that's that's it for the for for the for the for our header here um, arduino has the uh, when you open up a file in arduino it has a kind of setup function and a loop function it runs a setup function first and then it then loops for the loop function just as it says loops <laughs> um, okay Right, so in our setup function here, the first thing we're going to do is we're going to start our serial monitor because that's really useful for debugging purposes when our code doesn't work, as it inevitably won't. Um, and then we connect to the Wi-Fi. So Wi-Fi begin, uh, Wi-Fi SSID. Um, so there we're feeding it the credentials which we've just made up here uh, into the, 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 the Wi-Fi library. And now we're going to say, we're going to run a little while loop so we get some feedback while the Wi-Fi is connecting. Yeah? Um, Wi-Fi dot status. So we're saying if the Wi-Fi status function returns um, connected, there we go. If the Wi-Fi status uh, doesn't return connected, then we're going to say print connecting. Yeah, cool. Um, and then we're going to put a little delay in there because we don't want it to spam our serial monitor. Um, so it's going to it's going to print that every every. It's going to loop round and print that. So subsequently print that every half second. Um, Oh yeah, if we with this, when it prints out to the serial monitor, if we put an LN in there, that means line new. So it'll create a new line every time we print something out, um, which is a bit neater. And then once it's obviously connected, we can put a little bit of feedback in there and just say connected. There we go. Ooh. Okay, right. And that's the end of our setup. That's our, our setup done. So now it's just our, our main loop. Okay, so we're going to start filling that out now. So the first thing we want, because we want our um, the SP32 to have like a 10 second delay uh, uh, and print the message every 10 seconds. So this, our program's going to loop round and then post the message on Telegram every 10 seconds for us. Uh, wi Fi. Ooh. Okay, so uh, return here. We're just running another loop just to make sure it's actually um, actually made a connection with the uh, API, the Telegram API. Um, now, uh, if we Google, here we go. Uh, send message Telegram API. Let's have a look. There we go. The easy way. We like easy. Right, what we're after is a particular type of URL, that's it. So, 
Telegram's really simple. It's, you know, it's a pretty good, well-written program. So it's got a really simple API, which we like. Um, and uh, we can just send uh, a get request in, as a URL. We don't have to do any flashy uh, formatting or anything. Um, uh, I'm, as I said, I'm not particularly, this is all quite new to me. Right, okay. So we've already got the uh, URL there, the Telegram URL. So we don't need that, do we? So I'm just going to delete that. Um, and then these are the perimeters which need to be in the in the URL. So the first thing we need is the, the bot API key. So essentially, um, uh, we're going to have control of a bot who can then go and post on our Telegram API. Um, we need to be able to make the bot first. Uh, and luckily, Telegram has a really easy function for this called the Bot Father, um, which we're going to look into now. Um, when in Telegram, if you, at the top here, if you type in bot father and click on bot father, um, if we start this, <laughs> uh, we can click on uh, new bot here. You can see that kind of, yeah. Um, and then we've just got to name our bot. So we're going to call our bot um, uh, my BTC panic button. Okay. Now we need to give it a username. So... Uh, I don't know the difference between the two, but I'll just put my BTC panic button and it wants an underscore bot on the end to identify as a bot, I think. There we are, done. Congratulations. Thank you. Um, this is our API. So this this, this is our key, sorry. Um, so this essentially is like the private key to be able to control the little bot um, and get it to post on our, on our, um, on our, on our, our the group we're going to set up. So you need to keep this safe, just as you would keep your Bitcoin private keys safe. Okay. Um, the next thing we need to do is we need to set up a um, a group. So if we go here and then we set up a new group, and we'll call this um, my panic room. My panic room. There we are. And then we'll invite someone. So we'll invite a bunch of friends into my panic room. I've invited one. Obviously, you would, um, uh, you know, invite as many friends as you can who you can trust, um, and then hopefully one of them will, will see the message and get help to you. Um, once you've done that, now this can be a bit backward and doesn't really work properly, but we'll see if it works first time round. Uh, if we click on Add Members, if we um, so my what was it my BTC do a search for my BTC Panic button bot, is that it? That must be it. Um, and I click on uh, that and invite him. All right, and then I send a message to everybody on my group and I just say, um, hi guys, because it's worth warning everybody what this is. Uh, this is a group um, which uh, message will Okay, just warning everybody what this uh, what this group's for. Now, I think we just type in. Let me see if I can get this right first time round. I think it's the this URL here, the API. So HTTPS, and then it's the bot. Um, uh, I'm going to say private key, not private key, API key. And then I think just write and get updates. Okay, yeah, see, it's done it. That's weird. Right, so what we have to do, um, this is this is all a backward way of trying to get the uh, the actual ID for this, this panic room group. Because uh, it's not an easy thing to get the ID of a group, apparently. Um, so I think what I have to do is manage group. Um, I have to kick him out and then invite him back in. Remove. There we are. Sorry, mate. Uh, add members. My panic. Not you. <laughs> my panic. Oh, my BTC panic room button bot brilliant magic 
Let's invite him. Well, let's give that a whirl. Test. Refresh that. What's that all about? Why does it work second time round? Well, I won't ask questions, it worked. Right, what we want is this number here. I can't really see that. Can you see if you zoom in? Whee. Um, this number here with the little uh, uh, minus at the beginning um, is the ID for the actual room it's, uh, group itself on Telegram. So we take that and then we plop that there. We need to write a message, uh, but obviously in a URL, it has to be formatted in a certain way. You can't have spaces and stuff. So it's just something we're gonna, we're gonna Google and hopefully we'll, um, we'll find a solution to. Uh, so if we type in that like URL format, formatter. Um, uh, uh. Hyperlinks. No. Mm. Oh my goodness. URL um, format. Uh. Ah. Here we go. Fantastic. Right, so we're going to say um, help. My stash is under attack. Please send my, um, please call my local number. Um, my address is 15 uh, Funky Street, Lazy Town, um, and then your postcode or your zip, whatever you call it in the US. Okay, encode. Ah, cool. So let's put all the little uh, squiggles and wiggles and percentage signs and whatnot to actually make a URL. Right, so we're going to stick that in there. So we, now we could, before we do anything else actually, we could test that. Actually, before we do anything else, copy that. Um, if I go here and I type in API telegram.org and I paste that on the end and hit it. So I've just done a get request now to that, to that API using all those credentials. Hopefully it should work. Come on now, don't make me cross. Why didn't that work? Goodness me. Hmm, that's a bit disconcerting. Yeah, he's definitely called my BTC panic button. My BTC panic button. Mm. Oh, whatever. We'll come back to that if we can't get it working. And we'll do some. Um, Maybe, uh, yeah, I think we get some, um, yeah, we'll, we'll look at that in a, in a, in a minute. <laughs> okay, so let's, uh, let's get on with it. So now we need to do the actual get request using the, um, the client we made. Uh, so we made a Wi-Fi secure client, client here, and then we fed it the host and the, the HTTPS port. Um, so now we actually need to make the get request. So string, and then it's a get request. Um, and then it's the URL, um, which is the perimeters above here, obviously. And then we also HTTP, tell it what type of request it is, 1.1. And then we've got to do these. Oh. Um, back. Back in there we go. Um, I did that thing where I install my operating system and I don't put the right keyboard in and I'm too lazy to change it. I'm sure other people are guilty because they're doing, they're doing the same thing. Right. 
So these are just some headers which needs to go in the get request. I mean these are things you don't so when you visit a website with your computer um, uh, it's, it's doing a get request it's saying can I get information from this website or, or a post request if you're putting information on the website um, and it does all this stuff kind of under the hood so you don't realize it's doing all this stuff but we're physically having to go in and, and do this, all this stuff ourselves which is okay it's all learning um, I guess that closes the connection or is that a closed connection I don't know if anyone knows you can answer it in the old chat can you uh, And it's quite specific as well. You need to, so they're like um, line breaks. You need a bunch of line breaks before uh, at the end. Plus, doesn't seem to work properly. I don't know why. It's magic. It's all voodoo. Um, now uh, we're going to do a uh, a while loop, um, so we can actually get the connected. Get some feedback. So we're getting the response from the, the get request and then we're just um, reading as much of the response as we, as we, as we need to really. Um, I think, I think, I think, I think we are done. Um, so anything else I need to, oh yeah, silly me, um, yeah, we'll get it to, yeah. And we're done. Marvellous. Okay. Ah, there we are. So while the client is connected, um, we read the response until the line break. And then we're doing the same thing there. Why is that one highlight? Oh, there we are, missing. You see? Would have made a mistake, haven't I? I suppose everyone else picked up on that one as I was typing. And then we'll print out, print out whatever, whatever comes back. Okay. It's pretty cool. Um, I'm uh, I'm gonna try and upload this bad boy onto the uh, onto the SP32. Uh, first, I've got to select the port which I'm using. Um, okay, which is this one here. And now on Linux, I need to release that port. There we go. Um, Again, that's probably something I could fix permanently, but I'm just too lazy to do. Um, we're going to open up a serial monitor. Um, and then we're going to hit upload. I'm going to save it first, I think. Um, what should we call it? Uh, panic button. There we go. Two. I think we've already got one called panic button. Right. Okay. So that's uploading. I'm sure it'll come back with some errors. All right, here we are. So I've got a semicolon thing here. Also, I need to put in my Wi-Fi credentials here. So I'm going to cut to the other camera while I put in my Wi-Fi credentials. Um, 
Oh. Okay, let's try uploading that again. Um, right, okay, so you can look back there. What have we got now then? Are you expected it? What did you expect? What did you expect? What do you want? What am I missing? Oh, right, yeah, I need to put a silly me on the end there. This is the thing I'm. Um, I often fall short on, which I imagine most people fall short on, is the... Well, what do we need? I'm so, slap, so sloppy today. I imagine it must have been quite painful for actual developers to have watched me write that. If any actual developers are watching, um, it must be quite painful to, to, to watch those mistakes happen and me not correct them along as, as I go. Okay, it looks... It looks, it looks, it looks like it might actually be working. Pretty remarkable. Now whether it actually does the get request, that's the real question. Right, so it's trying to connect to the SP32. Now the SP32 has a kind of a, if I switch to the other camera, when you're uploading a script, you need to hit the, the reset button here, okay? Um, for it to activate. There we go. Um, and then it's actually, you can write the script. I think it's like a safety feature, I don't know. Okay, so it's uploading the script. Um, connecting, 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 connecting. Connected, there we are, that means we're connected to the Wi-Fi, that's a good sign. And then hopefully it'll do the get request. Should we check our Telegram group? Nothing. HTML, hmm, what's going on there? Okay, I think it's something in my URL itself here. Let's have a look at Mr. Botfather. Did I copy that down exactly right? Because I copy it. Interesting fact that the phrase debugging comes from when computers were really big and uh, little insects and stuff would fly into the um, chat ID and text. No, that's right. Um, little insects and things would fly into the uh, computers because uh, they're warm um, and then they'd start acting all buggy and strange so people would have to physically go in. Well, I've got two, two backslashes there. Physically go in. Oh, there we go. Oh, there we are. That worked. Oh, cool. Nice. So it is kind of working. I think it's working. It's working here. So if I hit that URL, there we go. You might be able to hear my phone going off as well. Um, hmm. We just need to get it to work here, don't we? Uh, hmm. Do you remember when I said that um, get requests can be quite particular? Well, I'll, I'll show you what it was, which uh, which was wrong. It was here in my get request, in my string, in my, my the first string which it writes at the, the top of the header is the get request. And then I need a space because obviously then it was like get and immediately the URL, there wasn't a space, it needs to be get the URL. And then look, there's a little space there for the HTTP 1.1 thing. So. That was it, and I won't tell you how long it took me to find that little space. There we go. Let's upload that bad boy now and see if it works, shall we? Goodness me. <laughs> Incredible. Um, this is why when you're a noob, everything takes so long. Right, so I pressed the little button. Hopefully for the last time. And then, once it's uploaded, Connecting, 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 connecting. Connected, and then it sends the request. Yeah, baby, look at that, flipping rad. That's so cool. So, where's my telegram here? So, 
So every 10 seconds we should get another message appear on the, on the telegram. Is it going to do it? There we go. Fantastic. Cool. And then all of our friends will then see that and they can, they can call the cops and help us out. So it is possible to, to um, buy little uh, ESP32 um, cases. I made this one, I printed it out on my 3D printer. Um, uh, and I made a bit of a bodge actually, that's why it's, so it's not the best looking thing, but uh, I'm sure I could probably blag a criminal that, I put it in wrong, uh, I could blag a criminal that this is my Bitcoin hardware wallet. Um, you could even have a, a fake safe, I guess, in, a, in another location which you could you could hide one of these bad boys in, or you could use it um, as some sort of, put some sort of switch on there, have some sort of latch, so you could have, a, if you connect it to a power source, um, like one of these uh, little LiPo batteries, uh, here we go, and then if we put a switch on this wire here, um, and then connect it to the, the door of our safe, then when the safe's, I don't know, open the wrong way or whatever, it could activate this and then that could send out the, 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 the telegram messages. Or you could just have a little push switch or a little a switch and you could have one of these next to your bed and if you hear someone attacking you, then you can quickly just switch it on or have it dotted around the house or have it next to, maybe glued to the side of the, the, the safe. So if, you, if, you, if they're, they're forcing you to open the safe, you could, you could click it on. So you, you could, if, you know, $4 a piece, you could, you could stash these all over your house um, and if you can't blag them into thinking that this is your hardware wallet, then, you know, hopefully you'll be able to get access to them to just use it as sort of a regular normal panic button. Um, but, uh, you know, the, the best advice for your, your Bitcoin stash is for you not even to be able to have access to it for, you know, if you've got a, um, a, a seed, split the, scramble the seed up and split it up and, and send it to the four corners of the, of the, of the, um, of the country or the, or the planet. So it takes you a good few days to, to get access to them. Um, and have different different tiers of security as well. You know, I mean, you, you have um, uh, a small stash which you use for for daily stuff or for trading, and then have your, your major stash have that have that somewhere which is really hard to get to and inaccessible. So, in the uh, tutorial with today, it's the first one. We've just taken a very small, simple hardware device, um, and we've made it an Internet of Things um, as a as a panic alarm, uh, which can send a message out to to get us help. Um, so, you know, but do be careful, do be safe, don't let people know that you've got Bitcoin. If you have got Bitcoin, keep them very safe. Um, uh, split those seeds up uh, and then have security measures like these. So, you know, you're not just relying on your chlorine gas. It's okay to ask for help. Um, uh, so hopefully I'll see you next time and then we'll look and explore more things we can do related to Bitcoin and these little Internet of Things devices.